Welcome back to our study in Philippians. We're continuing on uh, this morning uh, in our lesson series. And just a couple of things. Uh, one, I'm recording this outside. It's such a nice day out. Uh, so there might be some extra sounds, a little wind blowing my papers around. So we'll just uh, deal with that as we can. Uh, also, if you're watching this at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, uh, being one of the first people to watch this, uh, on YouTube there is, uh, to the right of your screen, a place where you can chat, talk about this video. Uh, this is being pre-recorded, so uh, you know it's not going to be live interaction. However, if you have any questions, comments, uh, any discussions you want to have on our topic this morning, what we're going to be discussing, uh, you can sign up if you have a Google account. You can sign in and live chat right there. I'll be on there uh, if you have any questions uh, to interact with you uh, on that. So we're getting back into the book of Philippians this morning. And uh, last week we looked at the very introduction. We got some introductory material going on. And uh, we really saw how the theme, just at the very beginning, was talking about the shared uh, gospel experience, how we are all partners in the gospel. Now, part of that, as we were talking about, was the uh, idea that uh, there's different parts of how Paul expresses uh, his letter and how he starts off his letters. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, the opening part where Paul gives the thanksgiving uh, in uh, Philippians. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles and read. Uh, again, we'll be reading uh, the first uh, seven verses here. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Within the world of sports, most of your professional teams are owned by a single person or a single company. Uh, there's one team in major American sports that is a little bit different, the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers uh, are a unique team. Uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin is a relatively small city, especially when it uh, comes to cities that host major professional teams, uh, especially within the NFL. But there's something that is uh, distinct about the Green Bay Packers, and one of the reasons why the team is still uh, successfully, after so many years, in such a small town. The thing that makes the Green Bay Packers unique is that instead of being owned by a particular person, the Green Bay Packers is community owned. Uh, you can own a share of the Green Bay Packers and so pretty much anyone who lives in Green Bay, Wisconsin has a bit of ownership with that football team. Now you can imagine uh, that if you have a bit of an actual ownership in the team, you're going to be rather passionate about that team, you're going to be very concerned about how that team performs and you're going to be very excited when the team does good. And so that is the success story of the Green Bay Packers. Now, when we talk about the fellowship of the gospel and how the Philippians shared in that with Paul, there's uh, you know, a lot of different ways that we might think about sharing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Paul has a very specific thing in mind as we look in the book of Philippians. Now, when we get in here, as we mentioned last week, Paul has standard uh, format for his letter writing. One of the standards is that he always, almost always, puts in a section of thanksgiving. The fact that he is thankful isn't so much important as it is the fact, uh, as it is what he says in his thankfulness. As he says, I am thankful for, and then what is it that is Paul thankful for? Now, when we look at this part of Philippians, uh, the very beginning, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every time that Paul remembers the Philippians, he gives thanks to them, to, thanks to God for them. Now, as we go through here, we see this recurring theme, every remembrance of you, always in every prayer in verse 4. 
uh, from the first day until now in verse 5. Uh, in verse 6, talk about uh, he who begun a good work, completing it in you. Um, and and uh, such as goes on in this theme, where we really have this repetition of Paul's really saying, I am really thankful for you. I am thankful for you here. I am thankful for you there. I am thankful for you everywhere. Uh, this, this amount of thankfulness that Paul has comes from a, a deep love in his heart, but there's also something more to it. Uh, when we look in verse 4, Paul tells us that part of his thankfulness is always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Every time he remembers them, he has joy. And what is it that brings joy? Well, it's the faithfulness that the Philippians have had in Christ, the faithfulness they have had in the gospel. Will we stop and think about this for a moment? The faithfulness of the believers brings joy to those who are ministers of the gospel. Our faithfulness, those who are our pastors, those who are, uh, have had an a investment in our lives spiritually, when we continue to be faithful to God, it brings about joy in their lives. A pastor that I know posted on Facebook uh, last week a note that he had received in the mail from one of the children of the church he pastors. And it was a sweet note. It, it read like this. Dear Pastor, I miss you. I wish we could have church. Well, we have church, but go to church. You're the best pastor ever. I love you. Now, a note like that received by a pastor is going to do probably more to encourage him than just about anything else that you could do, especially right now. I want to just take a moment here as we're uh, in a time where uh, most of us are stuck at home, we can't get out. Take some time and write a note of encouragement to your pastor. It'll mean the world to him. It's hard not being able to be with each other physically, not seeing us, uh, you know, week in and, and week out. Just take a no time and write a note. That'll, that'll do wonders. As we get a little more into the uh, thankfulness here, what is Paul thankful for? There are three specific things that Paul mentions uh, in our text that he is thankful uh, about the Philippians for. Uh, the first is, in verse 5, the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, the second is being confident uh, in you know, Christ's uh, completed work in the Philippians. That's verse 6. And in verse 7, is their continuing faithfulness, their continuing fellowship, even through uh, Paul's trials. And we're going to take some time and look at these in a little more detail. Probably the first point is going to be our longest point, the one we look at the most. We're looking at the fellowship of the gospel. So what is the fellowship of the gospel that Paul is talking about? Well, Paul is certainly would have somewhat in mind uh, the idea of prayer, of, uh, you know, the Philippians working themselves in spreading the gospel. Uh, and, and that is certainly uh, good for us to remember to do. But there's, in the context of Philippians, the, uh, really what Paul most likely has in mind is very specifically the financial gift that the Philippians have given to him. Uh, Paul does tell us in chapter 4, that uh, they have continued from the beginning, even when he went to Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica was the next place he went after Philippi. So, uh, if this is from the very beginning of his ministry. The Philippians were giving aid to Paul's ministry. And it's an aid that continued along throughout uh, the time that Paul was ministering. Paul was uh, spreading the gospel. So, it's... it's uh, when Paul's talking about the fellowship of the gospel here, he's talking about the part that the Philippians have in the financial side, in, in making sure that the gospel can continue on uh, because of the, the money that it's taking for Paul to do his trips. Now certainly Paul is um, not expressing things that the Philippians were giving money to him specifically uh, for him to enjoy to make his life easier. In fact, uh, as we get into the study later on in, in chapter 4, Paul says that he's, he knows how to be uh, 
you know, doing the ministry with hardly anything. He knows how to live uh, in poverty. So it's not a fact that he's, I mean, certainly Paul is thankful for the fact that he now has some money to, you know, buy some food or do some things. But remember, he's in house arrest, so there's not a lot he can do anyway. His main thought is that this money is going to help the gospel be spread. So uh, that, that's important to keep in mind. It's not just throwing money at Paul. It's not making Paul's life easier. It's the fact that Paul is thankful that the Philippians have given this money to help the gospel uh, be preached throughout the world. So we think about this as a financial gift. How do we use our finances to help spread the gospel? How do we use our finances to be a partner in the gospel? So uh, when we look at this, the, uh, there's a couple of things that we can uh, do. Uh, one of the main things uh, for us to keep in mind um, is that we make sure that those who are serving, our missionaries, our pastors, uh, those who are spreading the gospel, um, have all the resources they need uh, to evangelize. In, in the world when Paul lived and in the world we live in today, it takes money, it takes resources uh, to be able to do the work of the ministry. Uh, a lot of us don't like to talk about it a whole lot because there are those who talk about money and they use money in a uh, perverted way uh, you know, to enrich themselves. But there is a reality that it does take money uh, to get, keep the gospel going. So we need to make sure that uh, you know, they have the resources to do the gospel ministry. And this is going to include uh, you know, the pastor's salary. Uh, it's going to include making sure that we have adequate facilities to do the work. Uh, it's going to include uh, having the resources to do outreach programs. Uh, you know, the fact that we are able to uh, have this kind of Sunday school uh, recorded, uh, going through the internet, and be watched by people at home when we can't be together, it takes resources to do that. Uh, it takes resources to promote the church, for people to learn about the church, to send out uh, tracts, flyers, all sorts of things it takes uh, in order for the ministry to be done, uh, to be effective. And for us to have that heart that we want to make sure that those who are spreading the gospel have what they need to do that. Um, another part of using our finances to help uh, spread the gospel, to be partners in the ministry, is to make sure that uh, we freely give without conditions. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, that when we give our money, for we give it to the church, we give it to missions, uh, we're not tying our financial support to any standard of performance. You know, where we say, well, we need to make sure, Pastor, that, um, you know, you go out and witness to 20 people every week or we're going to cut your salary. Uh, now, you say, well, that sounds a little bit silly, but there are actually some churches who put those kind of conditions on their pastor. There are uh, some uh, churches, some mission boards that have put that kind of conditions on missionaries. Maybe not uh, that specifically, but uh, they, they say, you know, you've, you've got to show us some results for what we're uh, putting in here. Uh, you know, don't tie our giving to results. We tie our giving to faithfulness. How faithful is that person in serving the gospel? Well, certainly if someone is uh, not doing the work of the gospel at all, and they're just taking the money and, and hoarding it for themselves, we say that person's not really a worker in the gospel. Uh, but there are so many people who are laboring day in and day out trying to win people to Christ that, you know, we need to be willing to support them. <clears throat> Make sure that they are, are free to do that ministry and, and don't have to always be looking over their back, watching uh, what they do in case their money gets cut off. Uh, this is a little word here to anyone who's in a position of church leadership, pastors especially. Uh, if you're in a church that uh, directly supports missionaries, um, you know, make sure uh, that, uh, you know, you, you, the missionaries can count on you. Now, for those who are receiving the money, uh, if you're receiving money, if you're a missionary, if you're a pastor, and you ask your, uh, the people that you are ministering to or the people who are your partners, 
uh, to support you. Uh, you know, make sure that your financial requests are for the promotion of the gospel, not for your own sense of accomplishment. We're not trying to build buildings that are a testament to you know, how much great we have done. We're here trying to spread the gospel, uh, to tell people about Jesus. Uh, now, sometimes we have to build a, a pretty nice building in order to do that. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the pastor, uh, the preacher needs to have some nicer things. I'm not saying that that can't happen, but it's very easy to look at, oh, hey, I can get a little nicer car. I can get a little nicer house. I can have uh, this big monument that has my name, pastor uh, so-and-so, uh, some legacy left for me. You know, that, that's coming out of our own heart for our own greed, not out of a desire to promote the gospel. We looked at that last week. The, the whole thing is the, the gospel is central um, in our fellowship of the gospel. Also, um, you, know, you might have the right heart, but we also need to be wise about the money. Uh, you know, we can't just say, hey, let's throw money at a problem. Uh, we need people in the church, so let's go spend thousands of dollars on a promotion campaign. Uh, that may or may not work. Uh, you know, we need to be careful. We're wise stewards of God's money. And just because it's a, a great idea that works somewhere else or it's a, a great idea that I came up with doesn't necessarily mean that it's a wise investment of money. Um, you know, so we need to be wise about uh, that. So this partnership, this fellowship in the gospel that Paul talks about, um, the first day until now, he's talking about the financial partnership of the gospel. Now we move on to the second part of Paul's thanksgiving, this is verse 6, where Paul talks about his confidence that God will continue the work in the Philippians that he started and that he will finish it. Now this uh, passage is a little vague in its exact wording. And, uh, you know, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Um, now, our application that we typically go to with this passage is salvation. And it's very true that God started our salvation. We didn't start our own salvation. We didn't, uh, hey, I'm going to kickstart. I'm going to get my salvation going. God's the one who saved us. And it's God is the one who's going to complete the salvation. Uh, you know, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, some point in my life that, hey, you know, I got to uh, work a little bit harder to make sure that, uh, I keep this thing. God's the one who does that. Uh, but that's not the immediate context that Paul is talking about here. Uh, remember, everything when we look in Scripture, there's context of what is being talked about. And the context here is Paul's thankfulness for the Philippians. So when he talks about the work that God has uh, begun in the Philippians, he is talking about their salvation. Uh, but he's also talking about the uh, partnership they've had with him in the gospel. When we think about it in those terms, their partnership with Paul in the gospel started when they got saved. And their partnership came because they are saved. Their partnership in the gospel was because God worked in their heart and changed their heart. Uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. So that now the Philippians have a new heart, and it is out of that heart, this, the indwelling spirit of God that is in them, that they are being faithful and that they are partnering with Paul in this gospel. So, uh, when we think about God being the author of our salvation and the finisher of our faith, we can remain faithful to the end, to the end of our lives. Uh, it is something that we can do. We have the ability to stay faithful to God. So, when we think about in terms of our partnership in the gospel, especially in a financial uh, situation, we need to check our heart. What is our motivation? See, our motivation uh, for partnering in the gospel, the right motivation, what, what would naturally come to us is uh, something that is from the Spirit of God uh, to obey and to fulfill Christ's command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, if our motivation comes from anywhere else, the motivation to feel good about ourselves, the motivation to uh, attempt to earn favor with God, the motivation to 
uh, exert influence and control. If that's why we are giving, um, we need to get right with God. That's just straight up. Uh, if we think that we can tie our finances to uh, somehow God liking us better, if we think somehow that I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I need to give so I don't feel guilty about uh, not giving, uh, if I'm going to tie my finances because, you know, I, I gave so much money so they better listen to what I have to say. I, I'm just going to say it straight up. If that's your motivation, get on your knees, repent, and get right with God. Straight up. Um, there's no excuse for that. It's a sinful motivation. And get back to where you have this motivation, this heart, because God has done such a wonderful, awesome work of salvation in you. And he is working in you until the very day that you stand before him to make sure that your salvation is complete in him out of your love and gratefulness for him that now you say, I want to see others come into this gospel. You know, if you're requesting funds, if you're a missionary and you're asking people to support you, if you're a pastor and you've got some sort of uh, ministerial need, I'm just going to throw it out that here. Skip the guilt trips. Don't try to make people feel guilty if they don't give. Just simply say, hey, we're going to spread the gospel here. Let's all come together and be partners in that. So now let's move on to the third thing, the continuing through Paul's trials. In verse 7, as he says, I, just as I is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of the, uh, and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Paul talks about the continuation that the Philippians had. Uh, even in his chains, during his defense and confirmation of the gospel. And Paul evidently here has in mind both the uh, time that he is in right now in prison and time that he was uh, a little more free. And the Philippians never quit Paul. They continue to partner with him throughout the ministry. Um, you know, when, when they heard that Paul was in prison in uh, Rome, at this point, the Philippians would not have known how Paul had been able to use this as an uh, opportunity to see the gospel spread even more so. So, all they know is Paul's in prison. Now, from a natural human standpoint, we would think uh, that the main person who is going around uh, the whole countryside preaching the gospel, uh, now not able to freely go out and preach the gospel, would be a bit of a hindrance to the gospel. Uh, Paul says, no, no, it actually works out that the gospel spread. But the, the Philippians wouldn't have had that direct knowledge. They might have had faith, they might have thought about it, but they wouldn't have known it when, when they sent this gift to Paul. So here, even with Paul, in their mind, not being able to preach the gospel, they're still sending him support to help him spread the gospel. Uh, you know, we need to be careful how we treat uh, those who ministers, those ministers and ministries that we support. Uh, because we, we like to tie our giving, as we talked about before, to their performance. Uh, and, you know, if a, a certain person has uh, trouble in an area or something happens, we, we have a tendency, well, we're, first thing we're going to do is, uh, you know, stop sending them money. And, uh, you know, why were you giving them money in the first place? Are they still called by God to preach the gospel? Are they still working in the ministry of preaching God, uh, preaching uh, the gospel? Uh, now, I come from a tradition of churches where uh, the church directly supports missionaries uh, rather than uh, the Southern Baptist cooperative program where there's a pool of money. Uh, you know, in that tradition, it uh, has a great advantage of uh, the missionaries going directly to the church and the church really feeling like they are part of the gospel. Uh, but there's, there's a, a downside in that as well because I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of times where uh, the church gets a little bit sideways with um, 
a missions agency perhaps and they decide we're going to drop a bunch of missionaries uh, a new pastor comes in first thing the pastor says well um, I don't know this missionary this missionary this missionary so we're going to stop supporting them uh, you know this this is this is wrong um, you know we're not partnering with employees we're not we're not making a contract here this is the gospel of Jesus Christ we're talking about and uh, you know, if God is still using these individuals, we need to continue supporting them. Uh, we're going to find, as we go through Philippians, that uh, the Philippians sent this support to Paul, uh, and it, it was a financial sacrifice for them. So that, uh, for us to say, well, money's a little tight, so we're going to uh, not give money to missions anymore. That's not an excuse. Uh, we need to continue to partner with the gospel, uh, with, with these ministers in the gospel. So to uh, sum up, uh, a little conclusion here, we look at this part of Thanksgiving that Paul has given. Uh, Paul is so thankful to the Philippians. He uses terminology that is just filled with love and joy. And it is brought about by the faithfulness of the Philippians. It wasn't a one-time uh, event. It was something that they had been faithful to do uh, from the very beginning. Uh, you know, it's a partnership motivated by God in their hearts uh, to help spread the gospel um, and, and continuing through both the good times and the bad times uh, that Paul experienced. You know, we, we look at uh, what's being talked about here in Philippians yeah, about partnering in the gospel. And uh, it, it's amazing to think that, uh, you know, we can have a part uh, even when we're not able to go and uh, spread the gospel. We can still have a, a major part of that. Um, I'm a very big proponent of supporting missions, whether it be foreign missions or uh, here in the United States, church planting or, or some other mission type like that. Uh, because there are some people that are called by God to do that sort of work where a lot of us who are Christians are not. Uh, we aren't given the gifts to be able to do that, but there certain, are certain other people that do. And whether, whether you're someone who gives directly to a missionary or whether you're a church, that, that, like, like in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, that gives to a pool and, and, and given, we need to remember that giving to... Uh, the ministry isn't just a, a nice thing to do. It's not just a uh, obligation for us to do. This is our opportunity to be a partner in the preaching of the gospel. At the, the same time, we think about these uh, ministers that we love. Uh, you know, I've gotten to be friends with a, a large number of uh, foreign missionaries. And, you know, the encouragement that we can give to them, uh, one of the things that is um, common when you get a couple of people that uh, know each other uh, from years gone by, uh, I went to Bible college, and, and so many of us going to Bible college were, uh, we were there because we're going to be going into the ministry. And, you know, now it's uh, 20 years later, and I meet up with someone, we start talking, and we say, well, what about this person? What about that person? And, and uh, we think, well, you know, they're, they're uh, not in ministry anymore. We get pretty, pretty discouraged. Uh, you know, you, you be a part of a church somewhere, and, and you hear about some of the people that you knew there and, uh, from years ago, and, oh, well, they don't go to church anymore. And, and, and it's really discouraging. But at the same time, uh, you start talking about the other people that you know that for the last 10, 15, 20 years have remained faithful in serving God. And it's, it's just a, a bright spot. It's a, a, a joy uh, to my heart. Now imagine, you know, someone who has invested uh, spiritually into you. Now think about that person, uh, whether it be your pastor, whether it be a, a Sunday school teacher or, or someone else, and, and think about that. And, and think about uh, how that, if, if they hear about you being faithful to God, that you've continued uh, to do what you can 
uh, to help spread the gospel. Think about the amount of joy that will give to them. Uh, let's think about uh, in this time right now where you know pastors and, and missionaries especially uh, are having a very emotionally hard time. Let's, let's make sure they know that we still have their back, that we still love them, and that we still stand beside them in, in any way that we can. So, uh, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this time, and uh, next week we'll start looking at uh, the prayer that Paul has for the Philippians. Till next time, God bless.